All right, we've got lots to cover here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first Building Backyard Habitat webinar. We're really excited to have you here, guys. Um, I'm Morgan Sussman. I'm one of Fish and Wildlife's Outreach Specialists, and I'll be assisting you guys today with questions, um, which you're welcome to throw into the chat box throughout this webinar, and we'll get you answered. Um, with me here today virtually is Jessica Merkling, um, one of our urban biologists, and she's stationed up north. Jessica, you are more than welcome to go ahead and introduce yourself. Awesome. Can you guys hear me OK? All right. Um, I guess at any point you can't hear me, let me know, Morgan, and we'll go from there. Um, so as Morgan, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Jessica Merkling, and I am the North Urban Biologist, so I'm actually stationed out of Columbia City. Um, I cover Fort Wayne, South Bend, and Elkhart for habitat-related things, and then all of Allen, St. And Joe, and Elkhart counties for wildlife types of things. Um, and I guess with that, we'll get started on uh, building backyard habitat. Um, I do want to highlight this is likely going to be heavily focused on urban areas, but um, it's pretty applicable across the board for any backyard type of habitat, not just in urban areas. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is why, or I guess, sorry, the outline that we're going to go over today is to talk about why small scale habitat is important. And then we also want to talk about site selection and site preparation. I do want to point out that it is very likely that many of you who registered are probably thinking about part two for what you expected today. Um, but these are the things we're going to cover today, and then we will cover even more in the second part if you're able to attend that. So let's get started. So when we first think about why backyard is habitat, backyard habitat is important, it's because a lot of people tend to think that wildlife conservation happens in this really cool, magical place called out there. And that's out there. Um, I get a lot of calls about why we can't just take wildlife and move it, you know, somewhere out there. Can't you just take it somewhere else? Um, just last week, I actually had a person call and they were concerned that a construction agency was going to be building, digging a hole for excavation in an urban area. And the person was worried about it affecting wildlife and that it was also going to be in a highly visible area. The, the person's proposal was that, well, there's a lot of rural areas to dig a hole there. So wouldn't it just be better to do that? But there's still ramifications if you dig a hole in an urban area versus a rural area. So there's still a lot of places that conservation happens. It's not just a rural thing or an urban thing. So even though a lot of conservation happens out there, realistically, is as our urban areas start expanding, our out there is getting closer and closer to here. And there's less out there than ever before. And this is largely due to what we call urbanization, which is the spatial phenomenon by which towns and cities grow and develop and become larger because um, in central areas, everyone's central areas, and then the urban areas start to grow and become larger and larger. Um, and then what makes it really an interesting dynamic is that we know that a lot of people that care about wildlife live in urban areas. And we also know that it's projected that by the year 2050, about 70% of the world's population will likely live in an urban area. What makes it even more interesting um, is that 60% 60, 60 of the land that's going to become urban habitat has yet to be built. So if you really think about that, that's a lot of development in a short amount of time. And Indiana alone has something along the lines of 897 species of fish and wildlife. So we've got to start figuring out places and ways to do conservation and preservation, both in rural and urban areas and in our own backyards. To further drive this point home, um, this is an area in Fort Wayne, and this is an area in 1998. This area is about 12 square miles in size. And um, if you watch carefully, this is what it now looks like fast forward 10 years. 
so from 1998 to 2008. And for those that may have a little bit of trouble seeing it, those red circles are all brand new areas in 10 years that weren't there in 1998. If we fast forward yet another 10 years to 2018, it's even more developed. Um, so that was the first 10 years of new implementation from 98 to 2008. And then the yellow circles are from 2018, or excuse me, from 2008 to 2018. So we can see that urban areas are really um, accelerating and starting to get bigger and bigger and larger and larger. And this image shows Fort Wayne, but I do want to point out that I have a map like this for areas in South Bend, Elkhart. I've seen maps for it in Indianapolis. West Lafayette, so it's really applicable across the board. And I'm sure many of you, if you're out driving around, you probably have noticed an addition or something along those lines that have gone up recently. <clears throat> so even though we have all those things changing and urbanization that changes how we um, interact with our land, what happens is, is a lot of times during that urbanization process, people start changing the habitat which then in turn changes the interactions with wildlife and we may not always know that happens. And then that changes how humans and wildlife interact and it could be positive or negative. So we have to learn to start creating habitat to either mitigate those or to enhance the habitat to better enjoy a more diverse array of species. Um, to make it even more interesting, Indiana is probably arguably one of the most altered landscapes um, in the United States. And 96% of Indiana's land is actually privately owned. So that means when we actually want to start talking about conservation efforts, we really need to start talking to individual private landowners and even people that have backyard habitats and smaller acres, because that's really where we're going to have to go to start encouraging people to put habitat on the landscape for wildlife. If you look at our map here, um, browns are predominantly agriculture. Um, southern Indiana is really hilly, so it's hard to develop that. But then we also have these urban areas, a few pastures up here, and little places of water, but not a lot. And what this really points out is most of our ag land is pretty much corn and soybean. In our urban areas, a lot of our land is really big stretches of turf grass. And in any of those habits, it's essentially all a large monoculture, meaning it's all one of the same type of plant in one area. There's not a lot of diversity. And essentially, without a lot of diversity, there's not a lot of good habitat for a wide array of wildlife. So this is just another further um, reason why um, local small habitats are important, why backyard habitat's important, and why conservation and restoration efforts really need to be um, on the shoulders a little bit of private landowners, not just public landowners. It's a group effort for all of us to create habitat. When we talk of small scale habitat, there's likely most people are going to think of the benefits to wildlife. I work for the Division of Fish and Wildlife, so obviously people like Morgan and I are going to really want to promote wildlife. But there's also a lot of benefits for humans as well. There's been multiple studies recently showing that green spaces um, actually improve both physical and mental health. Um, they re help to reduce stress, um, it reduce different types of illnesses, help to maintain an act active lifestyle, which are all beneficial to humans. Um, if you do it correctly using, plant using habitat, specifically native habitat in the right habitat in the right area, we could actually reduce some of our energy needs. A good example of this is a correctly planted and placed tree could potentially reduce the, co um, the cost of your air conditioning running in the summer. Uh, we also, a lot of us really like our privacy. So native plants can be used as noise reduction barriers and visual barriers, maybe for things such as a really noisy roadway or for maybe not seeing the next yard neighbor for whatever reason. Then we can also, um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about um, habitat, but I'm also advocating for native plants and species. So if you do native plants, 
They actually have grown and adapted to Indiana's weather, their wildlife, and those types of things. So when you do that and use native plants and after they've established, you should see an overall reduction of maintenance because those native plants should require a landowner to have less mowing, less watering, less fertilizing, reducing uh, chemical application, and then reducing the cost that may happen if, for example, you pay for a really nice ornamental tree that may get destroyed in a winter or by a native animal. Then when we talk about wildlife, most of the benefits for wildlife are centered around habitat. And habitat for wildlife is the food, water, water shelter, and space that wildlife needs to survive. Um, and habitat loss is actually the number one biggest threat to biodiversity of wildlife across the globe. So that's another reason why it's so important to think about habitat needs. <clears throat> to make it more interesting, um, not necessarily a good interesting, but recent studies showed that the number of the mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles on our earth have actually been reduced by 60% in less than 50 years. So that's a pretty accelerated rate. So we really want to start thinking about habitat. When you think of habitat, I mentioned that food's one of those things. And creating habitat is actually a very healthy alternative to feeding wildlife. Many people care about wildlife, but they often associate helping wildlife with feeding wildlife. Arguably, if you create habitat, you'll have things like seed, grasses, insects that use those uh, resources that also feed wildlife. So you're giving wildlife a much healthier type of food that would actually benefit fit them even more than maybe bird seed or junk food, or some people even like to put out things like bread and donuts. So it's just a good healthy alternative. Um, I talked about space as part of habitat. Um, wildlife needs the space to move around and often in urban areas, you kind of create these islands of habitat and green spaces. So essentially different pockets are separated by things like roads and buildings. So if you create green spaces, it helps create corridors for those wildlife to move safely from one place to the other to find mates and those types of things. Cover and nesting material, they're kind of one in the same. Uh, and nesting material is a type of cover for wildlife. But essentially, you're providing those resources that are good for wildlife. So we kind of talked about the individual benefits for wildlife and humans, but we actually have a lot of overlapping benefits as well. So those same overlapping benefits are also listed on this screen. Um, one of the biggest things is clear air, clean air, clean water, and healthy soil. And that is something everyone benefits from, especially if we use things like native plants. So this image here is found in a lot of different variations on different um, websites, but it just kind of shows you that how deep these native roots run compared to some of our more ornamental species that are often used in the landscape. So these deeper roots, so for example, we have some of our non-native decoratives like daylilies and some of those perennial fountain grasses that are maybe three and a half to four feet deep. But then you get here to prairie drop seed and black-eyed Susan, two, uh, two species that are often um, encouraged to plant in our native seed mixes. They're getting down to eight feet. Um, this is a common nine bark, which is one of our native shrubs, and that's getting down here to 16 feet. We have a lot of uh, species like this in Indiana. And when you have these larger root masses and you have more surface area, it's more places for things like water to be filtered out. Uh, it helps to filter out chemicals, other sources of pollution that eventually will run into our drinking water, which also affects wildlife. It also helps with things like CO2 sequestering to help make cleaner air. Um, and when you have good soil, that's kind of the we're learning more and more how important soil health is, and it all relates back to a good function ecosystem that's healthy for everybody. Um, another thing that native plants do as part of that carbon uh, sequestering is it helps to reduce um, urban heat island um, indexes. What happens in urban areas with the built environment and the cement and the people and the cars and all those types of things, you kind of get this <clears throat> artificial increase in the heat which makes it hotter, makes it harder on the environment. 
um, when you heat up things like sidewalks and you have a rain event, that water gets heated up before it goes to our waters, which can cause problems for a lot of wildlife. So that's a really good benefit to putting small scale habitat in the ground. Um, diversifying our habitat is also a really good um, benefit. A lot of times when you have large monocultures, again, something that's all the same. For example, if a disease comes on the landscape and for example, it kills all of one type of flower, well then you're left with nothing on your landscape. But if you diversify and have more different species on, on the landscape, you're creating diverse habitat for diverse species and then you're hopefully preventing some of the habitat loss if, for instance, a drought or rain event or flood event, something like those comes along. <clears throat> uh, pollinators is another huge deal for small scale habitat. Pollinators are imperiled um, across the nation and I'm sure many of you on here today have probably heard a little bit about that. But pollinators are essentially the basics of all of our food chain. Um, they feed birds, they feed other bigger animals, and it just keeps going up the food chain. So it's really important for our wildlife. Additionally, um, one in every three bites of food we take is due either directly or indirectly to a native pollinator. A lot of times people think that only means honeybees. Realistically, honeybees are not native either. They have their place but they are also not necessarily as effective as pollinating our native plants as some of our Indiana native pollinators are. Another good thing you can do with native habitat is combating uh, wildlife issues. A good example of this is a well-placed native uh, buffer along ponds edges in you know, homeowners associations can help to reduce conflicts with Canada geese, for example. Um, it, benefits humans because you're reducing that conflict with geese and then it benefits the geese because instead of constantly being trapped and relocated and what have you they're at a number that's more acceptable to people um, and so therefore both humans and wildlife benefit in that way and then um, combating invasive species so we talked about how habitat loss is the number one biggest threat to biodiversity the second biggest threat to biodiversity is actually invasive species. And in the United States alone, we actually spend, <clears throat> excuse me, we actually spend close to $120 billion annually removing invasive species. And if you can already have native good habitat growing, there's less chances for invasive species to come and invade. So those are all really good benefits to both humans and wildlife. Um, so with that, um, it's kind of an in-between transition slide of what we're going to talk about next. Um, so this kind of goes into preparing what you want to, but it also goes to the benefits of what you're actually benefiting when you create habitat. So when you're thinking about habitat, you might want to think about what wildlife are you actually going to attract. <clears throat> now I do want to clarify that for the purposes of this presentation, when I refer to wildlife, I'm referring to non-domesticated native vertebrates and pollinators. So animals that would have nat naturally been on the landscape, so not things like cats and dogs. Um, and the other part of this is, it's really hard because good habitat is good habitat. And it's really hard to say, well, only this one species I wanted on my habitat, but I really don't want this other one to show up. If it's a good habitat, it's going to benefit a lot of wildlife, not just some. So that being said, some of the things that you can really benefit are those animals that we consider human associates, associates or exploiters, meaning they have increased benefit from living in close contact with humans because they can get things like artificial food sources and um, they can also have larger numbers because of things like reduced predation in urban areas. <clears throat> Some of those species, a lot of them are pollinators like our bees and butterflies. Um, I think the rusty patch bumblebee is one that um, was an endangered species, but they're finding that it actually does really, really well in urban environments. Um, the same with incorporating uh, milkweed in urban areas, which benefits monarch butterflies. We can also benefit a lot of our birds, a lot of birds, both raptors and songbird species. Some small mammals actually also really benefit from 
backyard habitat, things like gray squirrels. And then you also have the benefit for things like herps, which would be reptiles, amphibians, salamanders, turtles, snakes, those types of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that being said, what you may also end up doing though, and this is the big important thing to consider, because like I said, good habitat is good habitat. And it's great that we're having good habitat for all wildlife. But you may get these human adapters that kind of live on the periphery of urban environments and they're more edge species where maybe you have an urban area that meets um, a wooded area and that meets a field. And we have plenty of those sites in Indiana. <clears throat> so things like coyotes and white-tailed deer, red foxes and robins, they utilize human resources and survive in human dominated areas but they don't necessarily receive an additional added benefit like some of those other things in the previous slide do so that is something uh, that's really important to consider so we do know that these backyard habitats can provide a vast amount of species and wildlife but you may also be attracting things that you don't want so this is all things to consider when you're trying to think about building your habitat Excuse me. So now that we know why we're building habitat, one of the first things that we want to think about before we even get to selecting plants and how to properly plant them, we have to kind of ask ourselves these following questions. Who owns the property? What are the local ordinances? What are the long term goals of my habitat? What is my ability to maintain a habitat? And then you also want to get into what are the site conditions, which is probably most of what people automatically go to. But there's a lot of really important questions we should ask ourselves ahead of time. So one of the first things that I always like to talk about is ownership. I know this may sound surprising, but um, a lot of times this comes up where people want to maybe plant something along a ditch, <coughs> excuse me, or a roadway, but they don't necessarily own that property. Someone somewhere down the line eventually owns the property. So you really need to make sure you have permission to plant what you're planting. And some of those properties may have additional restrictions on what can or cannot be planted there. So one of the things that I like to go to is go to the county GIS websites. That's a really good place to get started. Usually you can just go into Google and count whatever county Indiana and then GIS and there's usually a lot of websites that are free that you can go and type in an address and usually can click on the parcel data. Some of the counties do have um, I guess almost like a subscription to it but that's just a really good place to start. Um, additionally uh, like places in uh, homeowners associations you can also often go to the association board <clears throat> even in common areas if you talk to them ahead of time, there's a lot of associations that are pretty open minded to put in habitat in areas pending approval of everyone else. If you go to um, if you don't know maybe who owns or is supposed to maintain a ditch, the surveyor's office um, is also a really good place to catch to to reach out to and talk about who should who owns the property. And then we should also think about uh, rights of way. Um, so this could be things like power lines, um, railroads, those types of things. Um, in a recent presentation I attended, we talked. they talked about how many acres are in rights of ways in the United States. And there's over 9 million acres in power line rights of way alone. And there's over 17 million acres in roadside rights of way as well. So think about that and realistically, most owners of that right away may never know that there's habitat out there until they come out there to do a service. And at that point, they do have the ability to tell someone to remove all their hard work that they had. So it's really important to get ahead of that before you even get started. Um, those of us, the biologists, we're not experts in land ownership and we can't enforce the law. But we can encourage you to check your city and county levels, talk about ownership. Once you've established ownership of the property, another really good thing to check is your local ordinances. Um, I can't imagine that this is most of the time a problem in rural areas, but I do know, especially in a lot of the urban areas in which I work, there's many ordinances that have height restrictions on vegetation, especially in neighborhoods. Sometimes even homeowners associations are even more restrictive. 
So I always encourage people to reach out and check their local ordinances ahead of time. There's oftentimes variances that allow for native habitat. Um, and I'm talking about actual native habitat. Sometimes, unfortunately, people try to use the system to where they just have no maintenance on their properties and call it habitat. But um, it's just really important to check those things. Sometimes you can make changes just through reaching out and education. I have seen people in the past write letters about why they're doing what they're doing. And then things like educating neighbors to make those changes and educational signage, which is something else we will touch on in our second part of the presentation, really help to show people that what you're doing is not an unmaintained habitat, that there's rhyme and reason to it, and it is beneficial. <clears throat> Again, the Division of Fish and Wildlife Biologists, we're not law enforcement, so we're not experts on the local ordinances. We can guide you to go check those out. But ultimately, we're here as a technical service provider to help put habitat in the ground. We can't change the laws for you, but we can just encourage you in ways to create good habitat. And that you want to think about or what are your long term goals of the property? What are the desired species that you want to attract? Um, again, a lot of the times that we're putting this in, we are focusing pretty heavily on songbirds and pollinators. But there are ways to think about things. Maybe you want upland game bird species. Maybe you want to specifically target monarchs. You can get pretty specific in some of those habitat types, but you can also be pretty general. Um, for example, deer pretty much will show up on any habitat you create. So those are things you can think about. We do have different habitat fact sheets on our website. You can see that there. Um, and I do know we're in the process of editing and improving our website. So even if it's not there, feel free to reach out and we can see where we can give you more habitat fact sheets from other sources if need be. What are you wanting it to look like? Do you want to have a diverse array of colors? Do you want to have different heights? A lot of people in urban areas are often concerned, especially around a pond or body of water, that they can no longer see the pond. Usually it's not the case, but it is something to think about. What do you want your end habitat to do and what do you want it to function as? Do you want it to be a prairie where you can just go and observe songbirds and butterflies? Maybe you want it to be a rain garden with native plants and that you want it to drain and really filter that water even more. Maybe you want it just to be trees and shrubs, or maybe you want a wetland, and then you can even break it down further. Maybe you want a wetland that's there year round, or maybe you want a wetland that changes with the seasons. So really think about what you want. Um, and then also think about how long it's going to take to establish. I think oftentimes when people go to put habitat in the ground, this is something that doesn't really get discussed too often. If you're planting from seed, especially native seed, we typically tell people that it'll take about three years to establish. Native plants, we show those really long roots. So those first two years, those native plants are putting down those roots to be good, fil good filtration system, and then eventually the flowers come up later. A good example of thinking of long-term goals is this project that was done in Indianapolis. So what they wanted to do is if you look really closely, you can see the sidewalk, but they first and foremost wanted to mitigate the number of geese that were coming up on the sidewalk. They also, I don't know if you can see it here, but on the far right there is like a lake over here that on the side that you can't see a picture of, they were having issues with erosion. And then they also wanted to make sure it was beautiful habitat so that, they're, um, so that the people that live there could enjoy it. So when it was planted, it was a successful habitat. This was what it looked like when we first started treating it. This is after one year of growth, and this is after two years of growth. So it did work and it did function as what we wanted, but we had those ideas in place and we thought about things about uh, geese trafficking over it before it was even established. So those are just things to think about. We'll talk a lot about maintenance in part two of the video, but when we talk about maintenance um, and before you even put it in the ground, when you do your site selection, think about how you're going to maintain it for the long time. Traditionally, when you put, excuse me, traditionally when you put a grassland or a prairie in, it's never going to be a situation where you seed it and walk away and never maintain it again. Most of our habitats aren't like that. Um, you have to think about how much time you want to put in there. What is the cost? Do you have um, do you have a lot of ability to put in any seed in there, or are you looking for maybe a more um, economical 
seed source or maybe more economical tree source, those types of things. What tools do you have available to you? Are you able to get a mower that can mow it high enough to create a good established prairie? Do you maybe only have a backpack sprayer to treat spot tree invasives? I mean, how much how much effort are you willing to put in? Those are really good questions to ask yourself. And you can definitely adapt your, your habitat according to your needs. What are some contingencies? If you plant a bunch of trees and maybe a beaver comes in and removes 10% of those, is that okay? Do you have a backup plan? Do you have a way to maybe mitigate those challenges as they come along? If there's a crazy weather event, do you have the ability to mitigate for that? A really good example is um, we had a site where we planted a bunch of seeds. It was doing great. Um, we did a frost seeding. And then the spring rains that were 2018, I believe, totally created a flooded site and put everything underwater for weeks. Luckily, we've made good selection in our seed sources and it didn't completely undo our work, but that is something to think about. Um, what are the ordinances again? Um, prescribed fire is a really good way to manage habitat, but you have to make sure you're following within your local ordinances to get that done. And then if something crazy happens, who is your technical assistance provider? Who can you reach out to if you have a question? I'm always already in my job. I always have other people that I ask for advice and opinions. And you know, all of the district biologists are here for you to do that. And then, like I said, if we can't do it, we do have some ability to reach out to others that may have more information. So I really encourage those people to think about that. Um, this is pictures trying to show you the difference in good maintenance and how it changes what your end result will look like. So both of these sites were prepared the same. They actually had the same contractor putting it out there on the ground and pretty much the same seed mix. So both of these are one year after seeding. So the picture on the left, the landowners mowed it to make sure it, get, it got established. And again, we'll talk about this in the second habitat part, but you can see the black eyed Susans coming up out here. There's only a few mares tail here and there. Um, there was partridge pea out there. And so we know that it's establishing pretty well. This pretty much is never got mowed as was recommended, and it's pretty much all ragweed. Technically ragweed and mares tail have a place, but it's probably not the end result they wanted. So even though it's not unsalvageable, uh, this property is a little bit behind the eight ball and getting it to establish better. And then finally, some of the things that you're probably expecting me to talk most of the time about were site conditions. So these are pretty basic things to ask about and things to think about before you even start selecting what plants you want out there, which is something again we'll cover in the next portion. But things about moisture, um, moisture is often, um, this is how most of the biologists will probably refer to the drainage classes. Is it excessively drained, poorly drained, anything in between, is it a muck site? But they're also referred to as mesic, wet mesic, dry. So those are another thing to think about. So there's a couple different ways that moisture is referred to. Think about the amount of sunlight. Are you in a shady area of sunlight? Do you have a frequency of flooding and ponding? Do you maybe need to select more water loving plants? Do you have a strong slope or an erosive site? So that may change how you establish. Again, think about the equipment access. Are you on a steep slope that you don't feel comfortable mowing? Are you in a mucky area where if you put a tractor back there, it's gonna be miserable to get it back out? Are you next to a waterway where if you use chemicals, you may need a specialist? Those are all things to think about. Some people like to think about historical cover and maybe think of a more of a restoration type of approach. That can be a really good factor influencing it. And then um, again, what is the designation? I don't feel like I come into this often, but sometimes we do have plantings that come up for maybe a floodway or those types of things. Now, one of the good sources that I really like to use for this that answers most of these questions, probably not historical cover and designation, and obviously you'd have to make your own determination for equipment access, but it's called the Web Soil Survey. It's available through the USDA's website, or you could just Google Web Soil Survey. You'll start the Web Soil Survey and select your area of interest. And then when you get to your site, you can actually click on the different soil types and it'll pull up things about the moisture, the sunlight, the slope, the flooding and ponding. Those are all really good sourceful and it answers a lot of your questions ahead of time. 
and even though we have online resources to look at these things, I really encourage people to walk the site to make sure it actually is behaving like it says online, because sometimes there's data gaps or it's been a couple years since the survey had been completed. So now that you've thought about all of your site's uh, conditions and selections, that's when you start thinking about site preparation. <clears throat> So one of the biggest things for site preparation is we kind of have to start treating our minds to think a little bit differently. Um, most of our prairie species that we want to plant for pollinator habitat, bird habitat, those types of things, they're warm season grasses, where our traditional turf grass are cool season grasses. <clears throat> our cool season grasses, like they sound, they, they actively grow in the colder months, the spring and the fall, um, it's often fescue or turf grass, not really beneficial to wildlife, um, but it's typically what we're trying to get it to look like, where our warm season grasses are completely the opposite. But usually on a native lawn, you're killing things like dandelions that, you, that actually are those warm season grasses we want to maintain. So you have to kind of train your mind to think about what a weed is or what it's not. We also have to think about tolerating messiness. Um, for good habitat, a lot of people and for, you know, backyard habitat, we're often thinking, you know, rake your leaves, um, trim down the tall uh, stems, those types of things. But realistically, those things can actually cause more of a problem, not create habitat in the way that you may think. And it's really hard because the idea of a lawn goes back to ancient Greece and it's again along many different cultures and uh, backgrounds and countries so we really have to get away from this nice uniform way of thinking of things and maybe a little more diversity again maybe thinking native versus non-native and then just having patience to see what's going to do wildlife will prove you wrong so you just have to learn to kind of roll with it and see what will happen <clears throat> um so i know i'm running probably a little bit late but i'll try and get through these last few slides really quickly so once you think about site preparation, then there's a couple of different methods that you'll want to use. But the biggest thing that's most important is that you want good seed to soil contact. This is true if you're planting seeds, <clears throat> if you're putting trees in the ground, or if you're putting plugs in the ground. You really want to eliminate the competition from the unwanted species that were there before. Again, you'll have to consider your site conditions to decide your method, so moisture slope, how big is your area? What's already there? Is it a bunch of invasive stuff or is it turf grass? Those types of things. Again, what type of equipment do you have available and how much time do you have to prepare? Maybe you have a project deadline. So that's something to think about too. And then think about the time of year you're in. If you're in the middle of summer, you're probably not going to effectively kill off grass and you might have to wait till the fall. Or if you're in the middle of winter, you might have to wait till spring to see what's already there to see how to treat it. Um, these are all pictures of different site preparations. What you can see here, this was just maintained turf grass. This one here is all um, a cornfield. This is right up to the edge of a building where we were going to put native plants in. And this is also turf grass but became a rain garden. But what you can basically see here, and the biggest point is, see how bare the soil is, the really good seed to soil contact to really get good establishment going. So once you think about those considerations here, I'm going to show you some of the most common ways people use to use site preparation. And one of the easiest ways that most of us recommend is herbicides. I understand how some people may not want to use those, but there is a way to do it correctly and safely. Um, and the reason we like herbicide is because it's pretty adaptable to most sites. It's really good for erosive soils or sites where there's a lot of slope. Generally speaking, it's pretty easy to find applicators. For some stuff, you can even apply it yourself with minimal equipment. If you're going to use herbicides, the cool season grasses should be mown down to 6 to 12 inches before you apply. And again, you want to apply when they're actively growing. Those cool seasons are actively growing in the cold weather in March and April and September, October. And that's when they're more likely to take out the chemical to actually kill them effectively so you don't have to keep over applying. Generally, when we recommend uh, herbicide, we usually recommend glyphosate, especially in urban areas, because most of the time when I'm talking about it, it's turf grass. There's a little bit of changes that you could do for 
egg fields, but most of the time it's a glyphosate base. Um, and the biggest reason for that, it's broad spectrum and it doesn't have long lasting effects in the soil after application. And the biggest thing for herbicide is to follow all your label instructions. <clears throat> It's technically the law, and it will also help you get the best results from a chemical. <clears throat> Another option is tillage, which is probably more often used in a bigger site like an old egg field or an old fallow field. You can do this by plowing or disking. Um, you're probably also likely to use tillage for mid-contract management or to help manage an already established area, but um, it can help with some eradication. It's good for non-erosive sites. The biggest thing for tilling is that you have to remember it's probably going to be a multi-season commitment. So you'll want to do it in the fall so that new growth is exposed to the cold in the winter months to freeze. And then again, as soon as the uh, roots come up again in the spring and the new growth comes up in the spring, you should do it again. And then one more time after it's green up after that. The idea behind that is you really want to extract all the energy from that plant to keep putting up new growth. The tricky part with tilling is you really don't want to disturb the soil too deeply. You only want the first two or three inches because if not, you might have more competition. For more urban areas, sod removal is another method. It's good for areas that have dense sod that have probably been regularly manicured for a long period of time. It's good for small sites and it's relatively affordable if you can rent a sod cutter or have a, maybe a spade or something like that. The downside is it can be labor intensive. If you ever had to cut through sod, you would probably know that it takes a little bit of work. Um, you still want to maintain the topsoil and the organic matter. Kind of an easy trick to dig up that piece of sod, flip it grass side down and let it die off and then plant into that nice um, organic material after everything's died off. It's really good for fast site prep, but it doesn't work for things like some of those printed Bermuda grasses that we may be trying to get rid of. Then a final option that's probably gaining more popularity is called solarizing. It's also called smothering or soil sterilization, light exclusion. Uh, there's a lot of different terms for it. This is probably only really beneficial on smaller sites and you probably don't want much of a slope and you'll need it to be in the full sun because by the name you're using the sun to kill off what's there. And again, you should be paying attention to the time of year you're doing this. You want to do it in that transition time from spring to summer when the growth is still small and young. The downside of it is it can take a really long time. Um, it can take up to four months. It's beneficial because that plastic can be reused if it doesn't get torn. Um, depending on what plastic you use, it kind of depends on your money that you have in there. Um, the, preferred, the preferred plastic is UV plastic, but that's really expensive. But if you use the black tarp, it's not necessarily recyclable. And it's going to look like you have a turf, or, or excuse me, a, a tarp on your property, right? And that may not be the most attractive thing for people to look at for four months. And then the other thing to be careful with is solarizing is you could kill microorganisms in the soil. Um, like I said, we're learning more and more about the soil health. I don't know if any of you have landscaping grass, but excuse me, landscaping um, cloth. But if you've ever dug up under there after it's been there a long time, you can definitely tell how there's not a lot of organic material there. <clears throat> So the biggest things to wrap up for site prep is you don't want to too deeply and you actually don't want to prepare with fertilizer because both of those things can actually increase competition with things that you may not want. You don't want to create unrealistic timelines for yourselves. Again, I think that's really important to understand that it does take time for native habitat to establish. And again, this is probably not what you guys thought of when you thought of putting backyard habitat in the ground. But good site prep is really important to have good long term habitat and then don't give up. It can be fun to experiment and see what's happening. And it's a process and it may take different efforts. And just because one site did what you said doesn't mean the next one will. So some good resources that will be available um, in a lot of different forums is on our on our website. We have native seed suppliers. Some of them are also contractors. We have those habitat fact sheets, um, the different biologists. Um, the USDA website for NRCS has a seeding calculator, which we'll talk about a lot more in the next presentation. Uh, the web soil survey and then your local soil and water conservation districts. And then Purdue Extension also has a lot of really good fact sheets and workshops and videos, just kind of like what we're doing today. So with that, I'm sorry I went over time.
time, but I will take any questions we have time for. <coughs> Okay, okay, so we've got, so we've got at a, least one question in the chat here. Um, Mary Kay asks, are there any handouts or suggestion sheets for information on how to approach a condo association? Um, that's a really good question. I don't have one that I know that's immediately coming to mind. But I'm sure there's places somewhere um, that might be something where I might just have to get your email and dig around to see what I can find. Okay. Um, I actually have your email, Mary, so I'll get that to Jessica and we'll shoot you an email after this. Peg asks, will we be able to recommend this later since it's recorded? Uh, yes, we'll be posting this on the website. Um, here, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat, but it is owen.in.gov fish wild ed, and we're going to have a list of webinar recordings there, and then we'll also have it on our Habitat Resources webpage. Feel free to drop any questions you guys have in the chat box. Go ahead, Jim. Do you want to ask it? Um, here, let me see if I can unmute you. I can't find a chat area, but I would like to. Will you provide addresses where we can uh, find native plants and grasses? We've had a hard time finding sources. So I think um, Morgan's going to send that out list later, but we do have a native seed supplier list on our website. It's in the habitat and information fact sheets area. And then additionally, I do know that the Native Plant Society also has uh, an additional list of some of our native suppliers. Okay, thank you. And I'll go ahead and send out some of those resources via email. We're going to be sending out a survey after this um, for you guys to provide us feedback and if there's any other webinar ideas you might have. Um, so I'll go ahead and send out those resources in the email too in case you're having issues. Here's the seed suppliers list. I'm going to drop it in the chat here. Any other questions? OK, Mary Kay asked, when is the next presentation? The next presentation is going to be on December 3rd. That one filled up pretty quickly, but we are going to be recording that one and posting it in the same location as the other one. Um, also, if you access this through the Facebook event, we're also going to be putting up a notice there when the webinar recorded webinars are posted. Peg asks, can you comment on helping neighborhood residents wanting mostly pretty flowering plants? That can be a very tricky situation. Um, I actually know this person who asked the question, so we've been talking a lot in the past. Um, but yeah, it can be really tricky. Um, it's, it's a big learning curve, honestly. There are ways maybe in like a rain garden or something like that where you can maybe cluster similar color types of flowers to make it showier and be a little more organized. Um, instead of using seed, you could choose to use things like plugs, which will establish quicker. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next presentation. Um, but ultimately, the biggest part is going to be a lot of education and outreach and patience as we try to educate everybody about the benefits of planting natives. All right, last call for questions. Oh, okay, here's one from Mary. 
Uh, one suggestion before the pandemic hit, I make a point to invite my neighbors into my yard and show them what and why I'm planting certain things. It's a good idea. And I'm definitely going to highlight um, in the next presentation why ways to help educate others um, as to show that you're maintaining a native habitat and it's not necessarily an unke unkept area. So there are ways to help educate and I will talk about that in the next presentation. Okay, I think that wraps up all our questions. So I wanna thank you guys so much for hopping on here. We hope you guys learned something new. Um, we're going to be sending out a survey after this and on there we ask you to provide us with some feedback on this and also if there's any other webinar topics that you're interested in having us cover. Um, we're always looking for future suggestions um, and then we will be again we'll be posting this recording on our website at that on.in.gov fish wild ed and then we will also be posting when that's up on our Facebook event page if you're on Facebook. Um, and then future webinars will be advertised on the DNR calendar. So we hope to see you guys in the future and we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you everyone.